Well, thank you for joining us today. And if you're welcome online, we'd like you also just to take the QR code at the bottom of the screen. And that helps you to fill out the Connect card that then you could see what's going on at the church and just keep you up on everything that's already happening. And if you're new here, um, in, in the front there, you can fill out a card, bring it to the Welcome Center. We would love to meet you. Uh, and get a gift and uh, take advantage of the Connect Center out there. It just has people who uh, would love to meet you. And we are a family. This church is a, a, a local family that, um, and just like the interactions of a regular family, at times it might have its you know difficulties, but you walk it out together and, and in love and connect with one another. So that's what we're here for. And to help with that, the church picnic is just in two weeks, Sunday, September 8th. We have an annual church picnic. We're going to provide the hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, drinks, place settings. We'd love you to bring something to share as well. So to help you out, you know, you don't have to. You can bring your specialty if you'd like, but if your name begins A through F, we'd, if you could bring a dessert, and if your last name is a G through Z, we'd like you to bring a main dish. And like we said, um, that is just to help facilitate, you know, having, having a lot of food there. Again, just we welcome you to come and sit and meet new people, uh, talk with friends, and it, we pray for a good day that day, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Also, next Sunday is Move Up Sunday, September 1st, in the Kids Cove. So kindergartners through sixth graders are going to move into the classroom that corresponds with their school grade. And during the service, we're going to welcome and honor the new seventh graders who um, have finished up in Kids Cove, and they begin entering into the Transform Ministry that we have for seventh through twelfth grade. So um, that happens next week. So young adults, we are so excited for uh, the uh, UP students that are coming, all the young adults that are here. We just welcome you, and we love having the diversity of we who are older to the young, and um, God really bless us, and we need each other. We need the young people. You guys hopefully need we as older people, and and so we're starting a host family program for young adults, and we have the opportunity to help, and we believe that God and the, the heart of the Lord is to connect, and he is a relational God. He not only came to seek and save the lost, but to invest in his people, and and as individuals or families we'd be in, who's interested in hosting a young adult, you could have them over to your house, share a meal, take them out to eat, connect with them on Sundays. Um, let us know if that's something you would love to do and like to do, and you can sign up at the Connect Center. And young adults, a time for you to sign up will be in the next few weeks. So we would really encourage you to take advantage of that. And, and just, we did this years ago, I remember, still remember the uh, AUP students that um, I had and just uh, the privilege of walking alongside. So it is a privilege to walk with one another. And as we see that in the heart of God, it's reflected in what we do and how we do it. So also, we've been hearing about fellowship groups. And the last few weeks, uh, we've been hearing about them. And today is the day to begin to sign up. We're kicking off our fellowship uh, group signups in the lobby. The fellowship group leaders are stationed throughout the lobby, and so feel free to walk around, talk with them, and uh, we want you to see that um, it is hard to really connect with someone on Sunday mornings, and uh, many times it's just, um, there's the busyness, the hecticness with children, with, with all this stuff that's going on, the activity. Sometimes we want to break it down, and uh, so it's a time where we can come in and just hear the Word of God reiterated, share it together, and that's what care groups are all about, fellowship groups. And so I would like to invite someone who's a little bit newer but has been in fellowship groups, Rick and Dina Van Horn, and they're going to share about fellowship groups a little bit right now. So welcome them, please. Good morning. Good morning. 
So as Cynthia said, what do you want to say first? No, you go ahead. He told me this morning he don't want to talk, and I'm going, why? Um, but as Cynthia said, we were involved with um, the fellowship class, uh, the fellowship group. We got here in December, and uh, it was through Deb and Dan encouraging us to come, um, and we didn't know what we was in for. We are like, well, what do you do there? She says, well, <laughs> and um, we're sure glad we went. If you're here today, you need to look into this. Um, I believe that this is a way God made us to be. And I went over this with Rick, but he, <laughs> he agrees. <laughs> if you want to walk on water through the storms, you need to get into God's word. And these pastors are so gifted every week to give us a message. And then we go to our group and we discuss it. And it, we chew on that. And I'm going to tell you something. It is really powerful because it has sure helped us. Rick? Yes. <laughs> I don't want you to think I have control over him. He really is saying he don't want to speak. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a place where you go and you have family and you have friends. But there's nothing like a family of God. And this is truly it. This is what we've been reading. We're both in our 60s. He's 61. I'm only 60. But we've been reading about this, and we've been looking for this all our lives, and I got goosebumps, but we found it, and we're just really embracing it. Please, please pray about and give it a try. No matter where you're at with your walk, you need this. Um, I did write Matthew 18, 20, for where two or more three or two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Hebrews 10, 24, 25, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and do good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Rick had surgery, and he had um, an accident seven years ago, and I was with God and brought him through it, and God paved the way. But this here, he sent us here because I needed help, and our group, uh, we're in a text, and we uh, have a prayer chain. I mean, it is just amazing because he had some really tough waves that we were riding, and I, I was praying by his bedside, and all I did was send out a text, and I'll tell you what, I could just feel, I could feel the Holy Spirit lifting us up and bringing us through, and the things that go on with our message on, on Sunday, or even just taking a Bible verse and chewing on it by what I say, chewing, just really getting in and relating it in, into your life. Pull whatever you can out. That's what this is all about. And when we come here Sunday, I don't know about you, but I don't want to leave. And I know there's a lot of you that don't want to leave either because y'all stick around. Because we want more. We know what God can do. His words are what we need to chew on, to feed on. And he has brought us through it. Right, Rick? Right. <laughs> you want to say anything else? <clears throat> well, I don't want to take too much time up here, but... Uh... I think a lot of you know that I put in a rough spring in the hospitals, and uh, I know for a fact that God heard your prayers because God was with me, and he brought me through some very tough times. And if it wasn't for you people out here that was praying for me day in and day out, I don't know if I would have made it. Um, I felt your prayers. And I just wanted to thank you all very much for supporting me and helping me through this time of trial. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. And one thing I just want to reiterate what Dina and Ricky had said there is it just allows us 
the application of the word and walking it with one another. It's, it's just one more means of grace. There's lots of means here of grace that God's equipping us with through women's groups and men's and care, fellowship groups. And so we really encourage you to consider that. And so thank you. And we welcome Joe up for the word. IUP students, welcome back. We love, love, love having you. Love having you. What? <laughs> Let me pray, and then we'll jump in. Jesus, thank you for a new day. Thank you that we are, live here in Indiana, Pennsylvania with IUP right in our backyard. And Lord, I thank you for all these students that have come this morning. I pray for each of them that you would encourage them, that you would help them, especially those who are here for the, the first year, to just navigate all the different things they have to learn. Lord, please, um, most of all, reveal yourself to them. Help them to know your love, and your care, and your faithfulness. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for all the young adults in the church. We pray that uh, as we gather this afternoon that uh, we would just get to know each other and enjoy each other's company. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, sometimes we're really strategic, and other times we kind of miss it. We are in the middle of a series in the book of Ecclesiastes, which, according to some commentators, is the most difficult book of the Bible to preach on. And so we also know that there's a number of new students here today. So you're coming, like, let's say, if it's a movie, we're about an hour and 20 into the movie. So I'm going to get you called up, and then um, hopefully we'll, we'll all... Uh, connect. If you have a phone or a Bible, uh, pull up Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8. We're going to work through chapter 8, chapter 9. To help us get oriented, brought a wiffle ball bat. And the reason is, uh, and I'm sure most of you have done this before, or not most of you, but many of you have played the game where you put your head on the bat you spin around 10 circles, and then you try to run from point A to point B. Raise your hand if you've ever participated in that. Thank you. Okay, that's good. That works. Um, it's one of those activities that's actually a lot more fun to watch than to experience. And you, like, there's all kinds of videos of people running through fences and crashing and probably hurting themselves. Um, I know the game as called Dizzy Izzy. It probably has a thousand names, but, but Dizzy Izzy is, is what I... Um, call it. And I want you to keep that picture because that's going to help us with the book of Ecclesiastes. So let's say you're born, that's point A, and you die, that's point B. Well, as we go from point A to point B throughout our lives, at times it's going to feel like dizzy izzy, that you are trying, you thought, I'll just walk straight, I go to college, I go do this, I get a job, I get married, I do this, all is well. And then all of a sudden you're, you're falling, you're crashing, you're you're stumbling on the ground, and what seemed like a simple task of just moving forward, you, you pretty much feel, feel hopeless or helpless at times. Well, Ecclesiastes is a book that deals with life as it truly is. So the main voice in the book is called the preacher. You might think of a, a pastor or an instructor or even a professor, someone who's just looking around and he's observing life. And as he's observing life, and he's considering the book of Proverbs, the book of Job. Ecclesiastes comes in and brings some more wisdom to our lives. And he also points out some of the inconsistencies of, of what seems like this should be true. If I live for Jesus, then all should be well. But then he'll point out there are people that live for the Lord. All is not well. And so he, he starts to look at some of these things that disorient us and spin us all around. And that's what we're going to do today. Because he's going he's to, I want you to picture this wiffle ball bat. And he's going to look at injustices in the world. He's going to look at oppression. Like people just are not treated fairly at times. It spins us around. He's going to point out that sometimes really good people die early and really bad people prosper, and live a long time. Well, that's confusing. Spin you around. Um, he's going to 
talk about these perplexities, but the beautiful thing is he doesn't leave us without hope. And in many ways, Ecclesiastes has these kind of sober, somber themes, and then this loud call for joy. And we're going to see both of those this morning. The big idea here is that knowing God is the secret to life. Knowing God, having a relationship with the living God, as Tim talked about this morning from the mic, is the key. It is the secret, let's say, to the good life. We're going to look at two points from these chapters. The first is walking in wisdom is the key to the good life. So we all want a good life. Now we're going to see, like, what does that mean? How do we define what a, a truly good life is? And you're going to, you're going to see that it, it might not be what we think it is. But the book of Ecclesiastes is part of a, the genre of literature in the Bible called wisdom literature. And so it's to make us wiser. And so he's going to jump right in to uh, a subject of how do you live in a, a situation where Maybe those over you are cruel or unjust or heavy-handed. And then he's going to kind of pull out of that. And he likes to jump themes all the time. That's where the Dizzy Izzy image happens. I think it helps me because he's going to jump from theme to theme to theme to another theme. But keep in mind, all of it's to impart wisdom to help us uh, make sense of the world we're living in. So look at verses 1 through 8. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A, man, a man's wisdom makes his face shine. I like that. The countenance is changed. You think of Daniel of the Old Testament in Babylon, Joseph in Egypt, Esther before the king. A, a man's wisdom or a woman's wisdom makes their face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. It comes from knowing the Lord. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, all man's troubles lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man, no human has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. And I observed all this while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. So this is like his observation. Now, we don't live in a monarch, so we don't have a king. But all of us, at some point in our lives, you're going to be in a situation where there's somebody over you. Maybe it's a professor. Maybe it's a boss. Um, maybe it's a relative. That you just need wisdom to know when to speak up and when to take a stand. And, and so he's trying to help us to, to think through that. And what he's trying to jar us to is, what are we living for? See, the wise know what they're living for. They know what will truly satisfy them and what won't. Jesus said it this way, For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world, forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So you think of Daniel in the Old Testament, he gets taken into captivity with all the Jewish people to Babylon. He's an intelligent guy. He's selected to be a part of this group. He could have just went for it. He could have just enjoyed all that was offered to him. But he had wisdom from his relationship with the Lord. And so he chose his moments carefully when he would take a stand. But all the while, his conscience was clear. Same thing with Joseph in Egypt. Brothers sell him as a slave. He's forgotten. Everybody but his brothers thinks he's dead. So he could have done whatever he wanted. And yet, he feared the Lord, he had a relationship with the Lord, and he kept his integrity 
when no one was watching. Esther, the same way. She could have been killed going to the king, who was her husband, which is not good. But they lived in a different time than we do. She took a stand to protect her people, to protect the Jewish people. And the story turned out really well. See, they're, they're wise. The wise learn to navigate, one to speak up, one to listen. So maybe in your workplace, you're, you're under an oppressive boss, a difficult situation. You need wisdom. When do, I, when do I speak up? When do I just work harder than everyone else? Lord, give me wisdom. Are you peaceful? You're going to have a whole variety of professors. Some will be really kind and friendly, and some will not be. Some will be very open to your, your faith in Jesus. Some will not. I remember when I was a senior at IEP, I wrote a paper for my senior sociology class, and I handed it in, and he handed it back. And he said, if you want a grade, rewrite it. Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I rewrote it, but didn't compromise my conscience. I was pretty bold about my faith. You need wisdom to know when to walk through these difficult things. And the Lord alone will help you navigate that. Verses 6 through 8 are interesting. And, and basically what he's saying is, no matter who it is, how powerful they are, we're all going to die. Nobody can escape death. Jesus is the only one that conquers sin and death. Look at verse 6 again. For there is a time and a way for everything. Although man's troubles lies heavy on him, so we feel that weight, for he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? One of the big things in Ecclesiastes is we're not in control. We are not in control. No matter how much we want to be in control, no, no matter how much we feel we're in control, we're not in control. So parents, we like to control. We want, we want safety, especially when kids are little. Like, we just want to protect, protect. You, you have to entrust them to the Lord. We are not in control, and it's a good thing. We're, we don't have the ability. We're not God. We're not all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, all-loving. Look at verse 8. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. No one. No human being has power over that. We can't escape it. Now, if you're newer to the church, I love sports analogies, but I'm teachable. So I'm going to use a, a, a poetry example as I'm getting older and wiser. So raise your hand if you know who William Henley is. Got any poets that we got? Yes. Good job. Saw one hand. Any other in the back? Well done, Stella. Well done. You, you might not know who he is, but you'll probably know this line. The, these are the last lines of his most famous poem called Invictus, which means undefeated or unconquerable. Uh, the line goes, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Raise your hand if you ever heard of that. There you go. So now you can use it in conversation. Oh, that's from Invictus. You know, one of Henley's poems. Um, but think about that line. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's kind of the human spirit. Like, we're in control. I'm going to conquer. I am the captain of my soul. No, you're not. No, you're not. And you will find, if you think that right now, you will find that is not true. There are things that are going to be so far out of your control. But here's the beauty of the Bible. We learn about Jesus who comes to rescue us, who is the true captain. He's the best captain. He's the king. He's the best navigator. He's the, the faithful friend. When all goes awry in our lives, he won't jump out of the boat. He is with us. He will keep you. So run to him. See, the wise learn to navigate life's wisdom. And, and the secret of wisdom is really genuinely knowing God, which brings us to the second point. 
Knowing God is the key to gaining wisdom. Knowing God. I chose those words very carefully. So it's not knowing about God. It's not being able to regurgitate the Bible. It's having a personal, living, live relationship with the Lord. So today, for example, the fair is happening today. I am not a farmer. I'm going to go to the fair. I'm going to look at pigs like I do every year, look at whatever's there. Um, I'll see tractors. If you're allowed to, I might even sit on a tractor, get my picture taken on a tractor. Um, Walk through all the stinky animals. I can get pictures with all of them. I'm not a farmer. After I do all that stuff, I'm not a farmer. We have farmers in the church. They can tell you, I'm not a farmer. They have great skill in farming. All I did was walk through the fairgrounds. So we, can, we don't want to live on the fringe of Christianity is the point. So some of you have grown up in Christian homes or Christian schools, um, Christian families, or gone to church. So you're, you get the kind of the, you're, you're close, you're in there, like me walking through the fair today. But being around God's people is not the same as being God's people. And so the push, and we're going to see this in this next section, is to have a live relationship with the Lord. That's between you and the God who made you. And that all starts with calling out to Jesus, who is perfectly God, perfectly man, and died on the cross to pay for all your sin all the wrong things you've ever done, and to wash away the guilt and shame that comes with those wrong things that you've done. And then to adopt you as his son or daughter. So that when you come into a Christian circle, whether it's a campus group or a church, you're not just walking through like I am at the fair. Oh no, these are, I'm one of them. I'm a farmer. Or I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, I know him. Look at verse 10. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go into and in and out of the holy places. So this is interesting. He's calling the wicked, and he's comparing them with people that are walking in and out of the holy places, meaning there are people that were going through the motions that weren't genuine and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This is also vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, meaning sometimes people do really bad things for a really long time, and seemingly have no consequences. But he's going to say, not, not so fast. They will have to answer for their deeds at some point. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life. So he's looking up, he's looking around the world. Well, this doesn't seem right. There are people just getting away with crimes, with sins, doing wicked things, and they're just getting away with it said, well, that may be the case in some situations. Yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. It will be well with those who fear God. This theme of the fear of the Lord is throughout the Bible. We're going to actually do a series on this in, in about a month or so. It's confusing because when I say fear, we don't think, oh, that's a good thing. We think that's a bad thing. And there are certain things we want to fear. So if there's like a, a rabid raccoon walking through the oak grove, well, you can fear that. That's, that makes sense. You don't want to pet, pet the rabid raccoon. You want to fear it. If there's danger, that's right. But when the Bible uses this description of fear, it's more in the awe, this, this recognition that God who made the stars who made the mountains, made the ocean, made humans in all our different intricacies. He's real. He's awesome. He's just. He's holy. We can live before him. And we, we can do that because of Jesus opening the way if you put your trust in Jesus. See, he says, yet I know it will be well with those who fear God, who live for the Lord. I I met the Lord at IUP as a a sophomore, so my my second year 
at IUP. So my, my first year was a mess. My second year, I encountered the living God. Now, the difference when you're living for the Lord and walking in the fear of the Lord, it means you're not, you're, you feel like you're missing out on things. I remember when I first met Jesus, and I'm going to repent of all my sin and partying and all that comes with it. And I remember like one of the first Friday nights, I'm playing ping pong in one of the residences. I was like, I hate ping pong, like to this day. I, it's like, but I was like, I'm going to do this because this is, this is I, I'm not going to do what I was doing. And so there's something good about it, very good, a clear conscience, a joy that I knew nothing of before. But there was a sense of, I, I might be missing out on some things here too. This temporary pleasure is not what I'm living for. And that's what the fear of the Lord does. See, there's a, there's a Bible verse that says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. God knows all and sees all. And that should have a good, cleansing, restraining effect on us as followers of Jesus, that I'm living for him. And so I'm not missing out, and I'm looking forward to one day when I will be with him forever. See, the key to the truly good life is knowing God. It's having a personal relationship. See, we might think of what's a good life. It could be having lots of friends. It could be getting whatever degree you're pursuing. That's, that's a good thing. We're, we're for that. It could be getting married. It could be getting a house. It could be getting a good job. It could be getting a better job. And it, it goes on and on. Those things in themselves are not wrong. But when we think that that's where all joy is going to come from, that's where deep satisfaction is going to come from, it's not true. It will not satisfy us at the core level. Only knowing God. The opposite is also true. If you know God and he defers some of those things that you are longing for, you can still have a peace and a joy that transcends those things, that those those things could never, ever, ever touch. So knowing God does a lot of good things. Knowing God prepares us for all the inconsistencies and injustices of life. Verse 14, there is a vanity that takes place on the earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens the deeds of the wicked, meaning there are God-fearing, Jesus-loving people that really bad things happen to, and it's tragic. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the righteous, the deeds of the righteous. This is also vanity. If you're here during the summer, um, we taught you a word in Hebrew. Does anybody who was here want to share what that word was? Hevel. Hevel. All that word means, that's a word for vanity. Hevel, it, it's, it's this elusive word that means life is puzzling. The, the imagery we've tried to use, we, we try to use a lot of analogies, but one is smoke. It's like smoke at a campfire. It, it comes up and then it just goes. You try to grab it. It's real, but it, it's, it's perplexing. It's puzzling. It's puzzling when Jesus-loving people experience tragedy. It's puzzling when people that go headlong into sin seem to always get away with it. Now, we know one day King Jesus is coming back. But in the meantime, we don't live in that time. We live in this time. And so it can be perplexing. But knowing God will protect you from the confusion that that creates, meaning God's character, you want to be gathering from his word, not from what you see with your eyes. If you go from life experience to what you see with your eyes, you're going to go up and down, no doubt. If he is the anchor of your soul, and you believe as he is revealed in all 66 books of the Bible, oh, he's good, he's trustworthy, he's faithful. He's going to see us through this broken world. I know without a shadow of doubt he is loving because he sent Jesus, his precious only son, who did no wrong to take my wrong upon himself. So I'm not going to doubt his love. I don't understand, Lord, why this is happening. I don't understand why why no relief is coming. But I know you are good and trustworthy. 
See, knowing God is the only anchor that will protect you when those waves come, when those massive waves come. Now he's going to switch again. Knowing God enables us to truly enjoy life. He said, and I commend joy. This is where he like spun us around 10 times like, well, you don't seem like you're commending joy. You seem like you're commending us to feel really depressed and sad. But then he calls us back. No, there's, there's a call to joy. As broken as this world is, you can be joyful and enjoying, especially if you know Jesus, enjoying these gifts that he provides. I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Meaning, God gives us good gifts to enjoy. We're going to see more of that in a moment. Knowing God also prepares us to be okay with mystery. Look at verses 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the busyness that is done on earth, how neither day or night do one eye sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out work that is done under the sun. However much man toils in seeking, he will not find out, even though a wise man claims to know He cannot know. In other words, there's just going to be things. You could be so wise. You could have spent time with the Lord for years and years, and something happens, and you just don't know why. We always want to know why. There are things we don't know why. Lord, I'm just going to rest in you. I'm going to trust you. I don't know why this is happening, but I trust you. I'm going to rest in you. See, knowing God alone helps us to make sense of the world. Look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 9. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, but all are before him. What he's saying here is he's looked around and he's recognized that there has to be a God. God exists. What I don't know is, is is he a good God or is he a bad God? That's this this idea of, is it love or is it hate? Is it a God who will accept me or is it a God who will reject me? And the more we study Ecclesiastes, the more you see this show up in Jesus' teaching and in Paul's teaching as well. What he's getting at here, and, and we see this in the New Testament as well, is if you take an honest look at the world around you, particularly creation, and you really look at it, and you really consider it, there's no way this has all happened by chance. There is no way. Only God could have made it. Only God could have made the stars in their perfect placement, put our star, the sun, in the perfect proximity to the earth as it's tilted sideways. Obviously, I'm not a scientist, but even, even from my vantage point, like, okay, that, that took a creator. That took one who had design behind it. Some of you, probably a lot of you, went to cool places this summer. You sat on the, the edge of an ocean, and you watched the, the sunset the golden hour. You took your pictures. There it was. You timed it perfectly. If you really look into that, wow, man, this this points to a maker, to a creator. Some of you were in mountains with incredible views. Boy, this this couldn't have just happened from glaciers. There had to be a hand behind it. Some of you were in places where you were camping and you, there was no natural light at night. And you look up and you just see the sky lit up. See, the Bible tells us that because of creation, we can know some things about God. We can know he's powerful. We can know he's, he's the, the maker. And that's enough, Paul says in Romans 1, that, that we're without excuse. We've we got to answer for that. But what we can't know from creation is that God is a loving God. 
God is a merciful God. We need God's revelation, the Bible, to know that. So look at um, verses 2 through 6 here. It is the same for all since that happens, the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. And as the good one is so the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to us all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But he is who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. I don't know why that struck me as funny, but okay. <laughs> living dog. So to be alive is better than to be dead. So rather be a little dog that's alive than a ferocious dead lion. He likes imagery. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, he's not talking about heaven. He's not talking about what we know from the rest of Scripture. He's just saying they're, they're dead, and eventually they'll be forgotten throughout history. Regular people, like name a regular person living in Ireland in 1835. Unless you're related to them, you got nothing, right? And there was a lot of regular people living in Ireland during that time. Um, verse 6, their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. He's, he's just grappling with, like, hey, this is reality. The, the world, will, as we know, will not last forever because it will not last forever. So he's taking us, once again, he's taking this bat, he's spinning us around, like, I thought we were supposed to be joyful, and now you just spun us around, and now I'm falling over again, I'm not, not real happy. What am I supposed to do? Well, he's going to grab our, our, our head again, and he's going to call us to joy again. Look at verse 7. Go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. Drunkenness is a sin. Wine in moderation can be enjoyed if it's not a temptation for you. A lot there, but that's the short of it. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let no, not oil be lacking in your head. It's a call to joy. Many of us will enjoy gifts from God today. Many of you, those of you who are IEP students, you've been enjoying gifts from God all week. You've been playing spike ball in the Oak Grove. You've been hanging out with friends. You've been meeting so many people um, You've been catching up with old friends, those of you who are not first-year students. Uh, all of us have opportunities to recognize, okay, this is a gift from God right now. What, what Dina shared earlier, just having Christian fellowship, that's a gift from God. Talking to people, sharing a cup of coffee, that is a gift from God. Enjoying good food at a restaurant, that is a gift from God. This Friday, I got to have lunch with one of my, my closest friends, and we, we ate lunch, and we enjoyed each other's company in a sunny day. That's a good gift from God. Hiking in the woods, good gift from God. Sitting on the couch with your spouse, a good gift from God. See, knowing God helps us to see these things as gifts. Not gods themselves that will bring ultimate satisfaction, but gifts from God that we can be really thankful for. Look at verses 9 and 10. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. That, Jason did a good job explaining. The vain's probably not the best word for, for the hevel. Um, it could be better said all the days of your puzzling life, your confusing life, your disorienting life um, that he has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you're going. So we will enjoy good gifts from God. Even work itself is a gift from God. So if you're a student, whatever age level, do your work as unto the Lord with all your might. Whatever your 
vocation is. Work hard as to the Lord. And it will, it will open up opportunities for you, for sure. But even your ability to work is a gift from God. Your ability to be a student is a gift from God. Your ability to think and write and process and analyze and synthesize information, all gifts from God that we should give thanks for. The ability to exercise, the ability to do sports, all those things are gifts from God. So for the believer in Jesus, we, we put him first, and then those things fall into their proper place. Where we get in trouble is when they get flipped, and times and outcomes of, of athletic accomplishments are, are the, the ultimate. And when they're not met, or when injury happens, it's just crushing. That's always disappointing, but having spent time with a lot of IUP athletes, those who are just grounded and centered in Jesus, they, they, they can ride that a lot better. Not perfectly, but their ultimate joy and hope is in Jesus and not in statistics or times. So all this is connected to knowing God. Make him your number one pursuit. No matter how old you are, make God, your number one pursuit. So a question would be, is he your number one pursuit? If, if you had to give a, an, a, like a, a report of time spent, thought life spent, heart desire spent, is it trending towards him or trending away from him? If it's trending away from him, you have an opportunity to, to change, to turn, to repent, to own that, and expect that you're going to be happier that there's more joy that God has for you. Um, verses 11 and 12, knowing God prepares us for suddenly, sudden calamity when it comes. Sudden tragedy is always tragic. There's, there's just no way around it. There's, there, you can, it doesn't matter how mature you are as a follower of Jesus, it will sting and like this bat spin you around and for some, it takes a really long time to even be able to stand again. But knowing God will give you a bedrock that when you are stumbling and when you are disoriented, that you are safe and secure, and Jesus has you. Verse 11 and 12. Again, I saw under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those who have knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, how much time he has. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon him. We live in a broken world. Tragic things happen. We need to keep our eyes fixed on the living God. Last point. Knowing God produces wisdom that transcends anything this world can offer. Look at verse 13 and following. I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun. It seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered the poor man, and I put parentheses, except the Lord. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. He is living for an audience of one, and that audience, the Lord himself, sees it and knows it. Then he concludes, the words of the wise heard in quiet, are better than shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So what's the secret to living a good life? It's knowing the Lord, making Him your pursuit. The best response to this would be talking to a friend, 
hey, let's pray for each other. Let's keep encouraging each other to seek Jesus first above all things. And if you don't know Jesus, today's the day. Call out to him. We'd love to talk to you. He will respond. Let's, let's all stand. I'm going to pray, and the band can come up. God, you are a good father. You are a good father when life is sunny, birds are singing, and laughter is in the air. And you are a good father when life gets dark and confusing and disorienting and the wind blows hard and we get tossed and thrown around. You're still good. You're still faithful. You're still trustworthy. And so, Lord, we pray as we sing this final song that you would help us all to sing it with faith and with conviction that you truly are a faithful and good, good father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.